Okay, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> looks like uh, it's 1.30. Hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, go ahead and uh, wait till we're live streaming again before we get going. Okay, just want to check with our staff. Are we, are we live now? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. Welcome back, uh, committee members. Uh, appreciate the continued work and hope you had a good lunch. Uh, next up on this agenda, uh, we're going a little out of order, but we have uh, Byron Oden Coben with the uh, Sheriffs and Chiefs. So welcome to the Agriculture Committee. Byron, it's good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to be with you today. And uh, I'm kind of enjoying this Zoom meeting side of um, being able to participate and uh, be at home and over lunch, ran out, moved the tractor, parked a grain drill, and uh, <laughs> after after my little helper got it cleaned up and came back in and now ready to present with you. So <laughs> kind of adds a new dimension to uh, multitasking while uh, attending a meeting. Uh, thank you for indulging me earlier. Uh, I thought it was important to hear from the county attorney uh, to kind of help continue on with the discussion you started on the the statutes with Director True and the LSO uh, outline. Um, I must say I'm gonna steal the LSO outline because that, that's a nice compilation kind of in order of the Wyoming statutes that bounce back and forth as we've kind of heard between Title VI and Title XI. I do wanna take a minute uh, and kind of answer a couple of questions um, uh, as we went back and forth, if I can make, do this correctly. Um, so there's a question early on in the aggravated cruelty to animals, and there seems to be a, a slight degree of confusion uh, with the third bullet point on that, in which um, it's, an, it's the crime of aggravated cruelty if, or when, I should say, a person poisons or intentionally, shoots poisons or intentionally acts to seriously injure or destroy any livestock or domesticated animal owned by another while the animal is on property where the animal is authorized to be present. So I think it was indicated, but I want to clarify a little more. That's for the um, random act, if you will, uh, the shooting from the road, the, the shooting of livestock, when the livestock is where they are supposed to be, and you aren't the one that owns them. Um, so that takes, that's where we would charge that uh, crime uh, for that destruction of property uh, i.e. livestock would be under this particular statute, if that uh, helps with that discussion. The other, a uh, couple of other points that I wanted to go through is, is kind of uh, picked up in terms of questions. Uh, we are, there's a distinction between being able to um, seize livestock and then solicit a bond to be able to pay for their care and, and health, usually involves a veterinarian, doing the health and welfare check, providing some cases medication, some cases shots, some cases just a nutritional diet uh, to be able to do and then recover so that the city or the county would recover the cost of, of doing that. And I think as was indicated, an animal that's run down in shape, starving, which is usually where we end up uh, with the issue once they've been on a uh, good feed for a period of time, certainly pick up and that not only maintains because part of law enforcement's mission through several statutes is we can do no harm. We have to maintain uh, the property and value. Thus, when we seize an item, we have to maintain it in the same condition that we found it. So the gun can't rust, the car can't uh, uh, be rusting away to nothing kind of a thing. We have to maintain it in a secure environment and protect it for the future, whether it's the return to the owner or the asset um, dealt with by the court. So that fund for livestock, for that provision for a bond to be able to do that for livestock, as the county attorney described was that in 2011, that was removed from the general animal section uh, to be able to do that uh, and turned over to more of a voluntary fund uh, with the attorney general's office uh, where it receives voluntary contributions. I know that fund has been used rather sparingly uh, to deal with that uh, big case, if you will. Um, I remember one in which there were, I think there was 20 dogs that were 
uh, chained up and were fighting. Uh, they were being held as an animal for fighting. And those dogs were impounded, cared for, and that fund helped reimburse the city and the county for, uh, for taking those animals and caring for them while the court and the defendant was uh, processing that issue. So it would be beneficial, um, although now with the downturn of the budget and those kinds of things, I don't anticipate that we would have a, a bill to reinstate the funding of those kinds of mechanisms, but it would certainly help uh, local governments deal with some of those big cruelty to animal cases in which you remove the animal from uh, the defendant. Because usually for law enforcement, um, much as Director True described, the same process happens for the animal on the on the pet, uh, if you will, as, as we do our best to educate first, um, a little more stern education uh, before we get to the point of a citation. And then, uh, of course, the discretion that happens with the county attorney, the courts, sorry, I moved the phone a little farther away toll free, I'm not sure what that is. Um, slip in the drawer, maybe that might be the thing. Yes, that helped. Um, the solicitation, you know, of what to do uh, with the court and how, how best to handle uh, that animal case. So uh, there's a lot uh, of the uh, choices and, and points along the way for that case to be disposed of long before we ever appear before the judge. I think as the Sheridan County attorney uh, described, that happens only a couple of times a year in the most egregious of cases and, and rarely does that uh, end up at that level. Um, there was some discussion and, and I guess uh, for the committee's sake, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, while the statute seemed to be unclear, once we've explained the statute and our first encounter with the person, whether it's the starvation, the cruelty, or how that may work. From then on out, um, it's a widely held legal principle that ignorance of law is not an excuse for not following through with what you're supposed to be doing. So it would be difficult to write a statute that covered all the bases to make sure everyone's informed on everything when if you're engaged in these kinds of activities, you're presumed to know what you're doing when you're doing them. Um, depending upon um, how you go about your statute um, crafting and which questions you have in terms of, of lumping things together or sorting them out, so to speak, um, I'm sure we'll be back in front of you with suggestions on that statutory change and statutory construction as it would have an impact on how we would go about our investigation, our education of the public and, and Last but not least, our uh, citation to those who we seem to need to raise to the level of appearing before the judge. With that, Mr. Chairman, I think I'll uh, take questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Overcoven. Uh, Representative Clausen has a question. Uh, Mr. Overcoven? Yes, sir. My, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Overcoven. So the, uh, the question I have is, uh, in this hypothetical case where if a law enforcement was overzealous and uh, the, the uh, bond that was put forth to take care of the livestock was extraordinary somehow, would there be any uh, civil relief for, uh, for a person that felt like they were, they were wronged by the system? Could they, could they take civil action against uh, the county or the city or whoever happened to uh, enforce this, this action? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you, um, I, and I'm glad that Director True is still here because the same process applies. So if I slip of the tongue in this, I think he'll be able to help clarify my point. Um, it is not so in the A to Z side of the house. So we receive our complaint, we go and see, we've already um, done our education, we're back, we're doing a citation now and we're, we're involving the vet, we're seizing the animal, and we go to a safe place and start feeding the animal. Law enforcement is not who assesses the bond. That is a court action in front of the judge. So the case is presented to the judge, parties are present, the owner is present, 
uh, in all likelihood or can choose not to. And the judge looks out and says, okay, we need to secure a bond for the care and custody because it's a certainly a different amount for uh, a dog versus 10 head of horses versus 50 head of cows. Uh, that bond amount would be contingent upon what the vet would recommend for uh, the care and feeding for that period of time. So um, I'm not, I, I hope I answered that without saying there's not an opportunity for an overzealous uh, law enforcement. It would be the, uh, in consultation with the vet, the seizing of the animal, the care that we, the judge then said must be paid for. Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Coburn. I do have that statute up uh, dealing with the bonds and uh, uh, basically it says the, the owner of the livestock uh, animal impounded under uh, subsection A um, who's been cited uh, will we'll post a bond with the circuit court um, and an amount the circuit court determines to be sufficient to provide for the animal's board, nutritional care, veterinary care, and diagnostic testing. So those are uh, uh, four specific expenses that are called out in statute currently. Um, and so I guess a question either for Mr. Overcoburn or for Director True, um, it seems like some of those are uh, required costs are gonna happen no matter what, whether the, um, the, those animals have been seized or not, uh, especially the nutritional care and veterinary care. However, the board is obviously an additional expense as a result of the, um, of the seizure of those, that property. As, and, and I guess I have a question about the diagnostic testing. What uh, is that the veterinary um, expenses associated with approving where maybe there's been abuse or not? Uh, can we just have a little bit more uh, definition of what diagnostic testing means to you? I'll let Director True start that discussion, if I may. Go ahead, Director. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, typically, and I can give an example of a horse in this percentage of the state <clears throat> that was pretty badly cut up and all of the costs and boarding at the vet clinic while that horse was stitched back together and started to heal back up, all of those costs were uh, part of a bond, which again was forfeited. And so under the, the forfeit statute, it doesn't ask us to dispose of the animal that says that the bond is not posted, the board shall dispose of the animal. So in that case, we use the astray laws to sell that animal. And I, I, would, I would say there's two times generally that that happens historically that I'm aware of in my tenure. One would be the court case is adjudicated against and there is no owner. So we obviously are now, or the agency, the, is the agency who sees the animals now in charge of that animal they ask to dispose of it underneath of our stray statute. We do that. Uh, there are cases where, uh, frankly, Ms. Bennett uh, made the point this morning that she hadn't heard of many of those, but if, if you're in a case of a seizure of numerous large livestock, there is always the potential when that bond is forfeited that the cost of care will outstrip the value of the livestock in a short amount of time. And so sometimes agencies will we'll need to dispose of that livestock so they still don't wind up upside down fiscally through the care of that beyond the forfeiture of that bond. Um, for an example, well, we'll say-, we'll just, say just, that, just to say, I, my, my question was dealing specifically with the <clears throat> definition of diagnostic testing. If you could maybe just address that, uh, what does that mean to you? Um, what, what's an example of diagnostic testing? Mr. Chairman, for diagnostic testing, that would be the veterinarian if the animal is is thin, we'll use a thin animal. The, the veterinarian will look at will look at dentition for age, for condition of the teeth. Is there a, an underlying health problem that's causing this animal to be this way, or is it just lack of feed? That's the diagnosis. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, so any further questions for the sheriffs and chiefs committee? Okay. Well, uh, stay close by, Mr. Overcoven. I appreciate your perspective and all, all the work that you do in conjunction with our livestock board and county prosecutors to uh, to uh, make sure that animals' welfare is taken care of. Thank Mr. You, Mr. Chairman. Director True, what is it? One, one little click add in the diagnostics. Many times these horses that, that are picked up, their feet 
are in really bad condition as well. So there'll be farrier costs. The veterinarian would diagnose that there's a need to bring a farrier in. Those costs could be applied as well. And that's distinct somehow from veterinary care, uh, which is also called out in statute. Well, the, the care would be, sir, but the, Mr. Chairman, but the diagnostic could be coming from the vet. Okay, so closely associated, but not exactly the same thing. Okay, committee, looks like we have no further questions at this point for our planned uh, uh, testimony. Uh, so we'll go ahead and proceed to public testimony. If uh, uh, LSO could uh, go ahead, just slide in the, the first person is going to be uh, uh, testifying. Okay, thank you. Uh, looks like we have uh, Brittany uh, uh, Walsh. Is that how you pronounce your name? Uh, please uh, if, uh, apologize if I got that wrong, but uh, feel free to uh, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us who you're associated with and then uh, go ahead and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that's right. It is Brittany Wallish. I'm the founder and executive director of Black Dog Animal Rescue, which is the state's largest companion animal advocacy organization. Uh, I know most of you have heard from me before on this topic, so I'll try to be brief. Um, but as you know, this is also a social issue that we have that we're dealing with. Uh, there's a lot of emotion and sentimentality wrapped up in the pets that we spend our lives with. And certainly I think some of the tension and frustration with the existing statute is stemming from some of that. So I'd like to just point out three things to you today. Um, my assessment of this is that the public sentiment clearly shows a need for enhanced protections for companion pets. And there are a lot, there's a lot of evidence to support this, but I'd like to point out to you first that we are seeing an increased incidence of people using companion pets as an avenue to perpetuate violence against a domestic partner in their home. And we know that this is an effective tool of uh, victimization for these people. On the other end of the spectrum, animal shelters all over the country are starting to transition their model and area of focus away from public safety and more towards social service provision. So these are just two of the examples that I have of the fact that the role of companion animals is evolving in our society and that our statute really needs to take into consideration uh, what, that, what that value is and how we're going to represent it in the state statute. I know that you know that the, the cruelty is addressed in three different chapters. I would point out to you chapter 35, there's already enhanced protections for certain kinds of companion animals. Uh, these are animals whose owners and handlers already share a deep bond and interact with these pets on a daily basis in the intimate and private settings of their home and work. These include police dogs, search and rescue dogs, and service animals. Uh, I would like to recommend that if these animals whose owners and handlers are afforded the respect of that personal bond and connection can be protected, uh, so too can our companion pets be differentiated and afforded additional protections within the statute. Lastly, we know that the statute is robust, but that it does not, uh, does not clearly or consistently define different groups of animals. And this is a consistent problem that we have run into in trying to explain to our constituents and our donors and people in the community why the statute can't be applied to dogs and cats in a backyard. Uh, we know that in different places in the statute, we see words used interchangeably to define animals. Sometimes it's livestock, sometimes it's a domestic pet, sometimes it's household pet, sometimes it's domestic animal. We don't know, it's inconsistent. The statute does afford clarifying language for standards of care, cruelty, and exemptions to cruelty for livestock, but it does not provide language for pets along the same lines. So these are some of the reasons that I think that we're going to continue to experience tension and dissatisfaction with the state statute. And it's one of the reasons that I think it's really great that the committee is going to consider looking at the statute in its totality. And I would ask that even though it is hard to recognize that there is a sentimental or social component to some of this, um, that when you look at these statutes, you understand that in order for some of that tension to be released and for people to feel as though 
the statute reflects the values of these animals in their lives, we're going to have to consider that in the language that we use going forward. So that's all I have for you today. And I would take questions from the committee. Okay, thank you, ma'am, appreciate it. Any uh, questions for our first uh, public testimony here committee? Any questions going once, going twice? Okay, uh, uh, I guess I have one. Uh, so uh, are you primarily focused on, I guess, uh, section 203 there, 6-3-203, which is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, most, most of the recent laws which seem to be in response to specific incidents. Um, uh, we usually kind of stick, it, uh, stick additional, uh, I guess, felonies uh, in, in there um, or additional opportunities for, for uh, prosecution. Um, is that, you think that'd be a good area for um, adding a different definition for household pets? And do you, I, I guess if you just go a little bit more detail as to the different types of definitions of animals outside of livestock, of course, um, and, and how that may play a role in our definitions, that, that'd, be, that'd be great for, for my understanding. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will attempt, I don't have the statute in front of me. Um, some of the difficulty that we have run into in the past in conversations of adding to or enhancing protections are that we, we have clearly different husbandry practices for pets than we have for livestock animals. And so anywhere in the statute where a change, an addition to new statute or a change in the language uh, doesn't specify the group of animals, uh, we come into a conflict with, with producers over something that really isn't a conflict. It's just that there's no clarification in the language. Um, so my, my thoughts on the subject are that there needs to be a very specific part added in there somewhere, and it needs to be consistent across all three chapters wherever we talk about animals that clearly differentiates between animals that are kept as pets in a home and animals that are part of a production line or part of a working group. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. And uh, um, yeah, glad, glad you had a chance to testify before us and just point out that uh, uh, if there is additional legislation, whether it be a committee bill or a personal bill uh, uh, that you or anybody you know of is uh, looking to pursuing, they can always reach out to members of this committee, uh, 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 to myself or I assume Chairman Hunt, if you want to get agriculture's perspective. And uh, the, the more work you do ahead of time, the less work it is during the session, I've found. So i just like to make sure that you knew that that door is always, uh, or that avenue is always available to, to folks who are concerned about animal welfare. Thank you for that. Okay, any, any questions, committee? Okay, well, I appreciate your testimony, ma'am. And uh, th thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Okay, and we have our next uh, uh, public comment. It looks like a Susan, uh, Susan Castaneda, if that's uh, the correct pronunciation, please uh, introduce yourself and, uh, and just uh, tell us who you're with and what, what your testimony is. No, no. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Appreciate no, wait. It. Are you talking to Brittany? I, I think I've got uh, a delay here. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're yeah. up, Susan. And if you have the YouTube have uh, link still going, you're going to have to go ahead and shut that off because we, we are hearing ourselves what we were saying about 30 seconds ago, if, if that's uh, filtering through your audio. Introduce yourself and. Uh... Okay. Okay, we can see and hear you uh, just fine. So thank you. I'm so sorry, Chairman Boner. My name is Sue Castaneda. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Cheyenne Animal Shelter here in Cheyenne, obviously. Um, I just wanna thank you first for the opportunity to speak before you and the Ag Committee. Um, the Cheyenne Animal Shelter is unique in our situation in that we are actually a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, for the past 50 years, but we contract with the City of Cheyenne and the County of Laramie to provide animal control services. And while we negotiate a yearly contract with them, we're finding ourselves left with a huge financial burden that far supersedes the amount of money that we are getting for these contracts due to lengthy court processes to adjudicate cruelty cases. Um, that 
eats up a significant amount of the funding and we are rarely if ever able to recollect any money from the owner. And in our current uh, COVID environment, the cities and counties are asking us to cut our contracts by 20%. So I'm happy to hear a lot of the things that have already been discussed, including the bond and forfeiture for livestock. Um, sad to hear that it one day got the uh, domestic pet side of it dropped. And I guess that's what we kind of might like to see brought back in. Um, so I guess from our perspective, really the animal cruel cruelty statutes are not the problem that we see. It's just rather getting court cases adjudicated quickly. We're seeing far too many cases where we're holding animals um, from a court case from eight to 10 months. Um, first one, for example, we had 21 Springer Spaniels that were found in the back of a car. We had to hold them for 125 days. Finally, we dropped the charges so that we could get these animals adopted and just ask the, the owner of them to, she could only keep two, they had to be altered. Otherwise we lost um, $76,000 in that case. Then most recently, last summer, we took in nine hound dogs. The, uh, it was a mother and father hound with seven puppies that were found in the back of a truck under a tarp. The mama's um, snout and back legs were duct taped together so that it would force her to nurse her puppies. The temperature in there was about 93 degrees. So we took them all in and um, basically those puppies grew up in our care for the next nine months, never knowing really grass, never knowing what steps were, what it was to like to ride in a car. And hound dogs are not necessarily that easy to adopt out <laughs> anyway. I mean, they make a lot of noise. Imagine nine of them. Finally, the owner was found guilty of one count of animal cruelty our cost being 78,000, he was um, fined a, a civil lien of $7,800 and he never did come to get the pets. So it's once the court case, even when it's adjudicated, the sentencing still doesn't go for two more months. So it's just hard for us to keep these animals for that long. Um, just a little history to um, animal control. Our animal control department has investigated 597 cases of animal cruelty in the past two years. Now that ranges from anything from dogs in hot cars at which the control officers do just try to work with the people. Um, well, if, the, if it looks like a really bad situation, we'll bring the dog in and just test it. But we do work with um, our constituents and people in the community to train them on this is, not, this is not the way this works. This is what you should do. We have Critter Camp that we help little kids learn how to humanely treat animals. And if we can, when somebody has an issue with behavior and a dog or something like that, we often use our behavior staff or our veterinarians to work with them so that we don't have to take animals in. Because really, um, it's not good for them. It's not good for us. Animals that grow up in our care or here this long, they become um, desensitized. They become kennel crazy. They also are just end up being warehoused. And so what we have just really been pushing back on in the past few months is trying to get the court processes to work faster and uh, more quickly and to make a decision. And it seems to be that there's not enough of the statute that says what the decision can be. Um, currently, I have a, a pit bull that attacked a husky in October. We've had it since then. This is not a dog that should be released into the public, although he's very nice with people. Um, he is going kennel crazy. And the sentencing from the man, again, was two months from the time he got convicted. So that said, um, he has a very dire medical situation going on right now. We tried to get, we got an emergency hearing with the judge who said that the owner of the dog um, has the right to make a decision about this dog's care, but no one can find the owner. So here we have an animal that we can't really, you know, we're doing our best by him to treat him as much as we can, but we're still gonna be stuck, I'm sure, with the cost of care for him. So um, we don't have the staff to file liens or, you know, using attorneys is very expensive for us. As we move forward with our contract negotiations with the city and county, we may have to come down to, um, if we have court cases like this all the time and we can't work faster or quicker, we may have to um, decide whether or not animal control is really worth it for us to continue to provide. And with that, I would entertain questions. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> thank you Ms. Castaneda. Any questions? Representative Blake. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Castaneda. The main thing that you would like to see changed is for uh, 
domestic animals that the bond be put back before the judge could put a bond in. And I'm not sure when that was removed. If you could, if you knew when that was removed, could you enlighten me? And uh, is that essentially what you and Miss Wallace are looking for in a statute change? Mr. Chairman, through you, Representative Blake. Um, I just the uh, prosecuting attorney who spoke just before lunch was the one who said that she believed that uh, Senator Burns had removed that provision years ago. So in my tenure here, I've not had the opportunity to work with that possibility. Um, Idaho has enact, enacted this same kind of bond and forfeiture. And in, in their case, and the way I think it could work well is um, someone is charged with animal cruelty. They have a court case coming up um, a month and a half from now. We figure out the cost of care up until that date, go to the court with them um, in front of a judge and say, either you can forfeit these animals to us now, or this is what you need to pay up front for us to care for that animal. Now, if the court date once again gets changed, we again figure out the cost of care and um, ask the owner to pay that. And so I don't see, as I know you've discussed before about returning any of that, really, I don't see returning any of that to an owner, even if he's found not guilty. I shouldn't just say he, I apologize. Um, but because it's still costing us to take care of that animal. So I'm not sure, uh, I think Ms. Wallace has kind of a different take, but I, the bond and forfeiture is what I would really like to see. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay, thank you, Representative Blake. And along those lines, I, I guess uh, there's been some reference to the former bonding ability for uh, household pets in addition to um, livestock. Do, do you have any perspective on the way that used to work, whether it's exactly the same as what we have in statutes for livestock or if there are some differences? Mr. Chairman, no, I, I do not. I don't, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, Ryan Shellhouse from the Attorney General's office was able to give me talked about feed liens and things like that, but um, it seems to be different for the livestock than for the animals. Um, I do, if you have any questions of animal control, I have two officers here. I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, appreciate that. Any, any questions committee? Otherwise I'll probably, I have a few more here. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> the next one, there's also been reference to uh, this cruelty to household pet animals protection account in the attorney general's office. Um, are, are you familiar with, with that uh, program? And, and if so, is it working well or is there uh, opportunities for improvement? Mr. Chairman, um, I recently applied for about 7,800 again for the cost of care for the hounds. Um, I was denied so far on, and then I have to just respond back with a more detailed amount of money that it cost us to care for the animals, which I can do. Um, however, I took into account in our, my first round of, of asks the cost that the nine hound dogs took up an entire adoption room for seven months in which I would normally have had adoptable animals there. And yes, you know, they're animals, but they're also revenue for the kind of work that we do. Um, so. I'm throwing that in, I, it has worked. I believe it's only been used three or four times by anyone. And I think it's mostly been by the animal shelter, uh, by my predecessor, Robert Becht. Thank you. Any further questions, committee? Oh, Representative Clausen. Mr. Chairman, um, ma'am, uh, with this, with this bonding scenario, would you see uh, more forfeitures for, or would you think there'd be more forfeitures for uh, animals uh, coming along? And that would that have additional costs to your operation? Uh, have it, or would you simply be able to adopt them out? Mr. Chairman, uh, through you, yes, we would be able to adopt them out if that is the disposition that we feel is the best for the pet. Um, we wouldn't be an additional cost necessarily to us because we could then adopt them out or for the very least not have to take care of them for months on end. And then again, they become victims of a type of cruelty on our end because we house them for so long. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, thank you. Okay, any further questions committee? Okay, 
saying none uh thank you ma'am for taking the time to, to speak to us and uh we'll see what we uh, we can do moving forward here with the especially with the uh this uh ongoing question of what the balance is to strike with the payment of it, what uh, i guess from the legal perspective is uh, also evidence but um also you know we have to take into uh, mind the animal welfare along that those lines too thank so, you for this Okay, so we have another, uh, I guess we have some more public comment in the waiting room. Oh boy, I'll pay for that. He had a, a Mr. Uh, Fetch, I think, if that's how you pronounce the name. Uh, he was in the waiting room. Are, are you here, sir? Mr. Chairman, it appears that after I allowed him to join the meeting, um, he was in briefly and then either got disconnected or left the meeting. I'm not quite sure. But he's not showing up either in the meeting or in the waiting room now. Yeah, I don't, I don't see him either. I let, let him in and... Uh, yeah, no, he's not here. Okay. <laughs> I guess we'll uh, go ahead and proceed. Uh, uh, thank you all for the public comments. We'll, uh, uh, I guess at this point, uh, public comment is closed unless committee, you have any last minute questions you wanna ask before we proceed. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close public comment. Well, committee, we have a very uh, complex topic uh, before us. I think there's some uh, lower lying fruit and others that uh, other issues that require uh, more, or I guess more legally complex and also require uh, buy-in from a, a large assortment of uh, various interest groups. Um, and so uh, at, at, just to share my perspective at the outset, it seems that uh, uh, with these issues, there's a uh, question of due process that's been raised um, with the uh, statutes were set up specific with livestock and that um, uh, it, it's entirely possible that uh, a, somebody's property can be uh, taken from them without any, uh, without any uh, trial um, and without any finding of guilt. Uh, the other side of it is that uh, we don't want to have a chilling effect on legitimate prosecutions either, um, and that uh, if we make them responsible for the costs or make the county or city government responsible uh, for costs associated with uh, boarding livestock, feeding livestock, or pets, that uh, if we make it too onerous on the uh, the folks who are excuse me, responsible for uh, upholding these laws, we might have a chilling effect on prosecutions. Um, in, in either case, it seems like the expense associated with keeping evidence, excuse me, <clears throat> the expenses associated with uh, keeping evidence in this case, uh, in this case, a live animal, is having a, a disproportionately large effect on our ability to, to strike that balance. And so, uh, we do have a, a few options uh, when it comes to due process. We've, we've had several uh, references to those Idaho statutes, um, which seem to strike a better balance uh, uh, and also provide uh, some opportunity for reimbursement, not just for livestock, but also for household pets as well. Uh, certainly there's a recent 
statutes that we changed within the past 10 years, it would seem that also provided reimbursement for uh, household pets at least. Um, so if we focus on the due process issues and the issue of cost, uh, that there's uh, several options available to us. In addition, if we want to take a more nuanced approach, uh, we could simply uh, um, uh, make some differentiation in the types of costs that are going to be charged to the uh, defendant, to the owner of the livestock or animals in this case. And uh, obviously some are uh, going to be costs that you're going to have regardless of whether those animals are impounded or not. Others are a result of the action taken against that individual. So uh, lots of complexities, but also lots of options available to the committee on that. Um, so that, that's, I think, one or two issues there, uh, potentially, depending on how you look at it. And then there's the broader issue, I, I think, of uh, why we brought uh, this committee, uh, this issue before the committee, which is dealing with um, the, the rather consistent uh, input we have from our colleagues, maybe those without a strong ag background or ag constituency, but are uh, constantly responding to individual circumstances of animal abuse um, and, and hopes that, uh, um, that you know, those, those sorts of actions could be uh, uh, prosecuted. And, uh, um, and whenever that happens, it seems like there, there's not a whole lot of consultation with those in the ag community. And we all kind of get a little, little defensive when uh, uh, those bills come up and, and don't necessarily draw a distinction always between a household pet or, or livestock. So. Uh, the attempt here would be to get a large group of people or a diverse group of people together to uh, hash out uh, some of those concerns in a way that works for everybody. And I, I don't have as many suggestions when it comes to how to address that issue. Um, so uh, certainly entertain any additional thoughts from the committee members as well as uh, uh, any, uh, any suggestions. So Representative Paley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of things. And it goes back to the uh, lady that's having difficulty uh, paying for the care and upkeep is, is when they're negotiating their contract or in statute, a person or a, us as a state could uh, put the responsibility of, of uh, paying for the upkeep of that domestic animal on in either the city or the county, whoever's putting that animal in there and, and put that financial responsibility on that entity. The other thing is it sure seems logical to keep domestic animals separate from livestock and livestock is defined in statute. And I would imagine somewhere there's a some type of a, a definition for domestic animals, but maybe we need to separate those two things out uh, going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I appreciate that, Representative Haley, and at least uh, reading in the criminal statute, it seems like there is no um, definition of a household pet, except in very limited circumstances, um, whereas, uh, you know, live, we're basically saying all animals except for livestock, and then we went, go ahead and uh, define livestock. So kind of a, a definition by omission, if you will. Um, uh, so that's, that's the way we do it right now. Maybe a more affirmative approach would be, would be helpful. Okay, Representative Clausen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my thoughts, uh, at least for for discussion or for, for bill draft purposes, uh, I think we should consider at least a, a bill draft going towards putting the bonds back on uh, uh, domestic animals, uh, or not domestic animals, but uh, but pets, simply to help out with uh, some of these real real occurrences where people aren't forced to make the decision that they need to come up with to forfeiture the animal or and I, in the process, in the due process portion of it, I think going before a judge uh, is a is a pretty decent way to uh, to at least plead your case if you feel that you're uh, you're being uh, dealt with unfairly.
Representative Blake. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Representative Kloss, and I think we should look at bringing back uh, the bond and forfeiture there for uh, pets, small pets. And we years ago we tried to <laughs> define household pets, and we got into iguanas and uh, you name it. <laughs> there was everything on the table. So the definition of a household pet is pretty can be very broad. But I'm definitely in favor of the bond and forfeiture thing for uh, household pets. Okay, Representative Tass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I have some real questions here. Uh, uh, the state's got all kinds of problems with our, our virus, our deficit, our, our taxes, all the different things that's out there. Granted, a animal cruelty is 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 a bad thing uh we've got and our laws may be scattered about in the statutes but uh i think they're fairly well covered i mean from the one attorney she kind of indicated there wasn't any glaring holes in our statutes even though it might be a little bit awkward uh i i guess this is a topic that i'm not horribly enthused about because we have so many other problems that I think the state needs to look at. I think our time, and I get in trouble here, our time's more valuable at this time, looking at uh, slaughter plants, uh, the backup of live livestock and the inventory, uh, how the ranches are gonna uh, hold things together, how the small businesses on Main Street are going to manage through, through the problems we have. And uh, granted that this is animal cruelty, uh, should should there possibly be a higher priority than than I think it is, but I think at the moment the states we've got our plates full, and that's where I'd like to see us spend our time. And so, granted that there's maybe some tweaking here and there that would help, but uh, for the time being, I uh, I would like to concentrate on what I think are are probably the more important problems the state has at this time and maybe address these at a, another time because it's there's a huge amount of uh, from what I'm seeing uh, a laws scattered all over the, the I don't see how you can take on one corner here and one maybe there without uh, disturbing all of it or without addressing all of it so uh, just my my thoughts uh, I, I think we may have even though it's important, we may have more important things. We do have more important things that are before us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And just to point out that we are going to have a committee meeting in two weeks that deals with those pressing issues, dealing with the um, the emergency session or the special session that's going to be sometime this summer. Uh, obviously, we have work to do after that. We're not just going to sit on our thumbs uh, throughout the remainder of the interim. So I think that there are portions, there are absolutely portions of uh, this uh, statute that we can fix um, and uh, without uh, uh, upsetting the rest of it or without uh, uh, causing uh, or, or without trying to take the whole thing on. So, um, and is brought up and, and you know, we appreciate the perspective from our sheriffs and chiefs of police from our county attorneys, but somebody who I neglected to include in this discussion would be our public defender. Um, so as with any attorney or, uh, you know, one, one side, one attorney's going to tell you one thing, another one's going to tell you the other. Uh, and I, I imagine if the public defender was here, they'd have a serious problem with uh, seizing property uh, without uh, any due process, which is uh, our, our statute set that up at least uh, within the, uh, the, the livestock world right now. I guess we're kind of considering potentially making that a possibility for uh, uh, household pets as well. So I think that is a, a property rights issue, especially for our ag producers that we need to uh, be aware of and, and just be aware, committee. We, we had a, a very uh, one-sided testimony today uh, that was focused on the people who were prosecuting these crimes who are, of course, every time they prosecute a crime, they think that that person's gonna be guilty. Of course, we know that in our justice system, uh, that, that's not always the case. Sometimes people who are prosecuted are found to be not guilty. And unfortunately, our, our statutes don't really contemplate that when it comes to uh, seizing livestock. Uh, so uh, when somebody is accused uh, of, of animal cruelty. 
So I think that's a very serious issue. It's a property rights issue for me as a rancher. Um, and I think it's something that could be addressed uh, either with uh, pre-existing statutes in other states or by uh, simply modifying very, uh, 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 in a very limited way, our current statutes. So anyways, uh, further testimony or comment, represent winner. Representative Winter, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I have to agree with uh, Representative Haley on this. I think his ideas to uh, remand this back to the county or the state might be the answer for that the Cheyenne group, uh, at least at this point in the process. Uh, uh, I like uh, um, Representative Tass' concerns uh, relative to uh, all these other things we need to be worried about. But I think uh, Representative Ta uh, Haley had a good idea and, and it might be well to consider that further. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion committee? Senator Cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Will this be on our August meeting as well? Because we could start something and then we can keep discussing it then. Uh, yeah, that's the plan, Senator, to um, have it at our August meeting or, or potentially the last meeting we have in the fall. Uh, but yeah, the intent would be to uh, deal with it um, uh, on that second meeting, uh, but it could also be the third meeting. But yeah, the point is we could, if we do get some bill drafts going or if we assign a uh, working group to, to uh, come up with some legislation that's be a, a uh, action that we'd have to take uh, right now today uh, and obviously recognize that we don't have all the answers but uh, uh, you know perhaps it's not prudent just because we don't have all the answers to sit on our thumbs. Okay further discussion committee. Okay, uh, uh, Senator Cost again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in going, I didn't get a, to read it real closely, but in reading the Idaho one, and, and I know you've read it much closer, um, maybe we should look at that as, uh, as a starting point on something that we can Yeah, I appreciate that that comment. Uh, it, you know, it's meant just kind of to uh, just to show how another state has done it. Uh, and I guess I could um, just kind of go over the, the highlights the way I understand it. Um, and uh, uh, basically, it's similar to our uh, bonding uh, statutes, except the the defendant does have an opportunity to uh, to basically have his say to his or her say in that process. Um, and so it's uh, basically uh, requires the uh, petitioner, in this case, the, um, uh, the entity that's supporting the animals or the, uh, the county or local government, whoever's paying for the cost of those animals to petition the court. And, but they have, to, and you know, it's gonna be approved unless a defendant objects, at which case uh, the petitioner has to uh, demonstrate that there's a, uh, uh, let's see, uh, probable cause, I believe. Anyway, so there's a legal standard there for, and that's a detail we'd have to hash out, but uh, they have to demonstrate that there's probable cause uh, continue to continue to um, uh, retain those animals, obviously. Um, uh, uh, you know, while the case is pending, it is possible that, uh, that, it, it, that uh, you could return those animals to, to the custody of the person under, under uh, under investigation. It's a possibility, maybe not likely, but I think it's important to at least allow the defendant an opportunity to, to defend themselves before the, uh, before they're determined guilty or not guilty. And then of course, the uh, provision that we had discussed earlier was that if they're found not to be guilty, then they uh, would uh, recoup the, the cost associated with that animal's care. And once again, we have to be careful there. I wouldn't necessarily be in support of uh, recouping all costs. I think there should be some a differentiation between the cost that would have happened anyways, whether that animal was uh, in custody or not, or um, 
versus the costs incurred by result of the prosecution. But anyways, uh, so you know, that's kind of an overview of, uh, of the Idaho statute just uh, for the public's benefit. Um, it could be a good starting point, even though I, I absolutely we, we'd I do a lot of work on it. Representative Blake, you had your hand up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there we go. I just wondered if you wanted a couple different ideas. I was just reading through that uh, Idaho statute, and I really like sections five, six, seven, and eight that really, you know, if it's a household pet, they could be a bond set right there and it says for at least 30 days and uh, just kind of skimming over it. But uh, I like that. I didn't know if you wanted maybe a couple ideas for some drafts for us to look at. One would be bond and forfeiture for household pets and another one for due process. So that's just my thoughts. Maybe we could have a, a couple of bill drafts like that and maybe have one that kind of folds the Idaho statute into uh, our statutes, if that's even possible, but that would be my two cents worth, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Representative Blake, I think we're at the point where we should consider uh, 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 motions to draft bills. If there's no further uh, committee, just general comment on this topic, I think, yeah, we're at that point where we'd be, we would entertain motions to begin official bill drafts. Yeah, Representative Blake. Yeah, I would just, uh, I would make that we have a bill drafted to look at, and I already sent Kayla an email. She's trying to research when that may have been taken out, if it was a, a law previously, but uh, maybe put back the bond and forfeiture for household pets there, I guess. Okay, moved by Representative Blake. Looks like seconded by Senator Cost, if that's correct, shake your head. Okay, so that's a discussion to uh, put in the, uh, reinsert the bonding uh, provisions that were in statute um, uh, back in. And Kayla, you have some uh, input there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to get clarification on the motion, um, whether that, whether the request is to put back in the bond and forfeiture language that was taken out in the past, or if the motion is to incorporate the Idaho bond and forfeiture language into the statute or if we know yet. <laughs> uh, the way I understood it is to reincorporate the, the uh, language that was in our statutes uh, uh, for, uh, for household pets. Uh, I'm not sure if Representative Blake has yeah. an opinion. Yeah, let, let's go with that, uh, Mr. Chairman and Kayla. Thank you. Okay, any discussion on that motion to get that bill draft going? Okay, uh, Co-Chairman Hunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, nothing particularly on the uh, the bill draft itself, but I uh, have been sitting here going through the uh, history of bills being brought to the legislature um, and started, I went back to 2011, but so thus far I haven't found a particular bill that I can find that particularly took that bond out, but I'm not, that's not to say it didn't happen, so just been browsing around. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, there's been several references to uh, um, to uh, a former bonding authority. Uh, uh, who knows exactly when it was removed, but I'm sure we could. Uh, first of all, I'm confident that that did in fact exist given the number of people who have t uh, referenced it and I'm sure our LSO staff could could uh, easily, easily find what those provisions uh, were and uh, that would at least be a starting point, I, I think. Call for the question. Okay, Senator Cost, and uh, we, there's been a call for the question too. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to say I would call for the question. I think this is a start, and we can move forward from. Okay. Any more uh, last minute comments? All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand and keep them up until we. Okay, I count seven. All those opposed?
Okay, I count four opposed, so that motion carries. Any further motions for bill drafts? Uh, Senator Steinmetz. Mr. Chairman, I would like to see us move forward with a draft to uh, strengthen the due process um, laws in this statute. And uh, why don't we start, see if we could maybe feather the Idaho legislation into Wyoming statute. Uh, that would be my motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, moved by Senator Steinmetz, second by Representative Blake to uh, have a um, uh, bill draft based off of the Idaho statutes. So it looks like Title 23, Chapter 35 um, of Idaho statutes uh, dealing with animal care costs. Uh, uh, Kayla, do you have a, a question? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think two questions actually. So the Idaho, um, the Idaho statute is section 25-3520B, is that correct? Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding what was requested by due process. Um, I think that's just the Idaho statutes, but I wanted to make sure there's nothing else um, envisioned as um, being requested to include in the bill draft as far as due process goes. Uh, why are, oh, go ahead, Senator Stylins. Um Mr. Chairman, I would assume this would be a project just like some of the others we're taking on. It's kind of a, uh, a starting place for us to begin from, and then we may need to navigate a little from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Representative Blake. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think uh, this could possibly take care of the first bill draft we had if it's implement it correctly. I think, uh, you know, we could decide on either one when we get there, but I like the Idaho language and uh, yeah, definitely support this. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? Okay, going once, going twice. We'll go ahead and vote then. All those in favor of Senator Steinman's motion, please raise your hand. Okay, I have uh, nine. Uh, thank you. All those opposed? Looks like two. Thank you. Okay, so that motion carries. All right, committee, any further discussion? Any further um, thoughts? Obviously, this is a huge, uh, huge topic. Um, there was, I think, some mention of a working group. Um, if anybody is uh, ambitious enough that wants to <laughs> uh, uh, kind of sit down with uh, those who are concerned with uh, animal welfare as well as our ag producers and come up with something that would maybe have, have a little bit of staying power um, legislatively. Um, there's been that discussion as well as a, a discussion that um, about just kind of a general cleanup uh, of, of the statutes. For example, there's a uh, um, you know, there's uh, different exemptions in uh, both the Title VI and, or similar, but not exactly the same exemptions in Title VI and Title XI. I think that, for example, when it comes to rodeo, there's exemptions in both uh, uh, titles, but uh, one just says rodeo, the other one says rodeo, as long as it's um, in accordance with standard animal husbandry practices. So uh, there might be an opportunity for just a little bit of of cleanup, if that's something the committee wants to take on, um, but certainly not a, a huge deal one way or the other. So a few uh, potential outstanding items, if anybody has a motion or idea, or even wants to volunteer um, to, <laughs> to uh, uh, kind of uh, be a part of an unofficial working group uh, between now and August. Okay, Representative Winner.
Okay, Representative Pointer, I, I think you were I think you might have said something, but you were muted there. You're correct. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I say I would volunteer for that uh, action if uh, if you need somebody. Okay, very good. That's uh, uh, it depends on what the committee wants to do, how official that wants to be. If we want to uh, give that uh, working group the ability to work with LSO to uh, draft a committee bill, otherwise we could always have a, as individual legislators, we can uh, have whatever bill drafts uh, uh, we want um, and then obviously present them to the committee on our own initiative. Uh, so uh, Representative Hunt, did you, did you have something to say there? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just, I wasn't sure if we wanted to make that as a formal motion to put a, a group of whatever three to five people together or if they're just a, they're strictly on a volunteer basis. But um, what, what were your thoughts on that? Well, we can always try motion and see how it works, I guess. <laughs> uh, that, that might be a good, good uh, prudent thing to do just to gauge the committee's interest uh, uh, as to how, how serious we uh, want to take it adding on this additional uh, additional work okay. so go ahead represent uh, thank you mr chairman I, I guess that's kind of why i brought that up so i guess uh, having said that i would go ahead and make the motion that um we uh form a working group of i'll just call it five members just to make it decent um not too big not too small odd numbered um to work further with LSO staff uh, on this issue um, with the intention of bringing something for our August meeting, so. Okay, is there a second? Well, I'll second it. Senator Stockman. <laughs> okay, further discussion on this uh, idea committee, I think uh, like I said, I think the value uh, for, at least from an agriculture perspective is that hopefully we, we can engage with uh, these uh, uh, folks who are concerned about animal welfare, uh, who uh, are fairly proficient at bringing a bill uh, just about every year that uh, may or may not have been uh, vetted with uh, agriculture in mind. I, I do believe that's prudent uh, to do so. I think it'd be worth our time. Uh, so uh, I'd just like to uh, throw that out there. Uh, Representative Haley, uh, you, you wanna say something? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I agree with the working group, but I think that we have uh, the working group on this Zoom call right now. And I just think that we're kind of putting the cart before the horse. And what I'd like to see is us develop, a, I don't know, a draft of a bill draft and, and circulate it amongst this group to get the input. So when we come out with a bill draft, it's, it's not going in six different directions. It's more concise and it addresses the issues that we heard today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further comment? Representative Tass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I agree with uh, Representative Bill here. Uh, we've got a pretty good group right here, and uh, uh, we're small enough that we can talk uh, between ourselves, and yet we're a lot enough in numbers that uh, we can get some really good uh, opinions. So uh, I, I wouldn't think we'd have to make it much smaller than what we have right here. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I can't hear him. Uh, representative Tass, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, you were pretty, pretty uh, coming pretty weak there, Representative Tass. So I, I, I heard you, uh, though, though just barely. Um, uh, so if I understood correctly, you're saying you're echoing what Representative Haley was saying, or? I'll try it again. Yes. Uh, and is that any better? My my microphone has quit working. So yeah, I would just agree with uh, Representative Haley. Okay, so it seems like some 
So if I understand, uh, I guess Representative Haley and Representative Taz, are, are, are you gentlemen saying we just should draft a bill, or authorize a bill draft right now and and uh, and just see how it works uh, <laughs> uh, and, and vet it with the committee before it becomes public and uh, um, just kind of go from there? Is that is that what I'm understanding or, or am I misunderstanding you? Are you talking to me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I just think that, that we need to do some more work as a committee together before we come up with a bill draft. I just think that we're not ready for one. And I like Senator Steinmetz's idea and uh, Representative Blake's idea, and I think we should be able to incorporate those. But I think we just need to kick it around amongst ourselves, and which we could do uh, between LSO staff, Kayla, and uh, this group and bounce ideas off each other and then let Kayla put them, them together. Because I think after we think about this the next day or two, which I'm sure we all will, uh, we're gonna say, well, shoot, I wish we'd have uh, incorporated this idea or I wish I'd have said this or that. That's all I'm saying is I just don't think we're ready for a, a formal bill draft. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Representative Hunt, you have something? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I mean, I, I would agree. I would agree with Representative Haley. I, I think um, we're, we're obviously not gonna get this hashed out this afternoon and we're not, I mean, we're really not gonna even get a thorough start on it because it's a very complex deal. Um, I, I guess that's why I put forward that motion of entertaining the idea of putting a, together a working group um, if, if, and I, I totally respect if the full committee would like to sit through those discussions and not have anyone left out, I, you know, I, I think that's totally fair as well. Um, and, you know, I would, in there, in which case would be happy to just withdraw that proposal. But I guess that's the idea is that if, if at least a few of us, um, if not the whole committee can work together over the next couple of months to bring something um, if not completely comprehensive, then then more uh, complete than what would be drafted by LSO alone or by just one or two members throwing in their ideas at random. Um, then I think that we are off to a better start come August. Then we have a you know a better framework to to go off of, and um, you know, and then we can fully flesh out the the idea and put details to it. So um, I and I guess I I would. I remind my, the committee, I believe, was that that motion is still out there lingering, um, although it may have died for lack of a second by this point. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, we, we still have a motion on the table. I think it's important to, or uh, in front of us, it's important to dispose of it, I, I think. It's a good discussion. So, Senator Steinmetz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was the second. So, um, I just did want to say I think there's a place for both of the arguments being made here. I think that the smaller group of people could really dig into some of the statute and do the work that is required in this area and then bring it to the broader committee. And um, I know a lot of us have different passions in different areas and uh, are kind of concentrating our workload in some of those other areas. So it's kind of the divide and conquer and then come back to the committee approach that might be helpful. And then we could have that broader discussion that we're all talking about as the as the Ag Committee. So just an idea that I don't think one idea is exclusive of the other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so any further discussion? Any further discussion? All right. Well, saying that, we'll go ahead and vote on uh, Representative Hunt's, Hunt's motion. All those in favor of forming a working group to present a bill draft at our next August meeting, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, I have four in favor. All those opposed, raise your hand. Okay, seven opposed. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's certainly something that, uh, uh, Representative Simpson, you have something to say? 
Mr. Chairman, I, for those of the public that are listening, I, I don't want to, that last vote to send the wrong message. I think we're all very concerned about animal abuse situations and we want the statutes to be strengthened. Um, that last vote for me was, I'm overwhelmed and I've got so much on my plate that to suggest that I'm gonna sit down and work in a working group over the next couple months is just, I've got too much there, which is kind of interesting. We circled back around to Representative Tass's comment earlier that we all rejected and yet, and yet that's true. This is an important topic, but are we just simply just overwhelmed and we have so much on our plate? Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to throw that out to the listening public. It's not that we're not genuinely interested in this, but I suspect many of you are like me and, and you just have so much going on right now that it's really hard to find time to do anything up and above what we're doing. Thanks. I certainly agree with that, that sentiment. Uh, we're all uh, trying to deal with the, the emergency situation. Certainly, I would argue even uh, you know, before this crisis hit, we had already just, just made the decision that we're going to use all of the legislative days available to us in, in session. That was a decision uh, our leadership made before we even got into a crisis. Now we're looking to burn through uh, at least half, maybe all of our special session days. So I agree with Representative Simpson. Uh, uh, and pointing out that and Representative Tass and, and in that specific instance uh, that we are uh, ourselves and our staff are overworked. Uh, we have to focus on the priorities and uh, I want to once again voice that concern that we are losing sight of the fact that this is a citizen legislature when we are um, at risk of going through literally every last legislative day available to us under our constitution. So and that has consequences that, that we saw here today. So uh, I'd also like to just point out briefly that, you know, this is the first of three meetings. If things are better in the fall after that August meeting, perhaps that is a, something we could consider in between our second and third meeting. So it's not necessarily a, a, a dead issue by any means and something that I, I personally remain uh, interested in continuing to, to uh, try to address if, if we have the opportunity. So Representative Tass. We can't hear you got me. nothing. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I was just going to agree. Uh, you know, we're asking for our, uh, not only a lot of work for ourselves, but uh, our LSO staff. This is a complicated uh, or can involve, uh, evolve to be a real uh, complicated uh, set of bills if we're going to clean up all of the, the ones that are behind us. Uh, I, I don't know, and just in consideration of our LSO. Uh, I, I think this is a good topic, but I think it ought to be pushed off uh, until a later time when maybe we don't have so many pressing issues on on ourselves, our LSO, and on the state. So, thank you. Okay, any further discussion committee on this topic or I guess in general? Okay, seeing none, just a reminder, we are scheduled for another half day meeting here uh, in two weeks. I believe it's the 15th, if I'm not mis mistaken. Uh, we'll have two bill drafts before us, one dealing with uh, both uh, COVID related topics, one dealing with uh, direct aid to producers, another one dealing with the supply chain issues that we've uh, discussed at, at length yesterday. So we'll be working uh, uh, diligently with our LSO staff to get a draft bill out as quickly as possible for that meeting. And that needs to be this committee's focus over the next few weeks and months. So I uh, look forward to continuing to work with the good members of this group. And uh, I know that we're gonna do good things for the agriculture and good things for the state of Wyoming. So uh, Representative Hunt, you have anything? Anything else for the good of the order? Questions, comments, Snyder remarks? No? Okay, well, I'll save that for later. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, good work, and we'll uh, see you in a couple of weeks. Let me know if you need anything, as always.